Mais bonjour à tous. Je regrette que nous soyons aussi peu nombreux compte tenu de l'intérêt des thèmes qui vont être. Good afternoon. Uh, it's nice that we are so numerous uh, in this interesting session. I hope that you take an active part here in the session. This afternoon, we are dedicating to the social aspects of uh, the uh, international transport. I'll speak in French. And uh, it is really a long uh, chain. This is the indication of the channels where you can listen to the uh, interpretation. I'll give a very short presentation and then uh, a personal uh, presentation. Then Madame Mukherjee will have the floor. And uh, then uh, you are called up uh, uh, to take the floor here in the same way as the audience. Please come forward, ask questions, and we will organize the discussion here to give the floor to anybody who asks for it. So let's go round the table first here. And uh, Mrs. Mukaji, you are kindly requested to present yourself. Uh, more an, an afternoon to all of you. Uh, my presentation is on the social impact of globalization, and I would be looking specifically on India, what is happening to India. J'aurais voulu que vous vous présentiez personnellement et puis qu'on demande à tous les membres de ce... Now, could you give a personal presentation of for yourself and we go round the table and then the paper? Pita Mukherjee, I'm a professor at Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations and to, our organization is based in India and we look into uh, India's globalization issues, India and the world economy basically. And um, I have worked on my core area of work is basically trade liberalization, GATS uh, and uh, infrastructure services and within this transport is one of the areas that I look into mostly from the angle of globalization and you, what should be government negotiating strategies in the WTO and in bilaterals. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dan Eikenson. I uh, am the associate director of the Center for Trade Policy Studies at the Cato Institute in Washington. It is a, a free market think tank. Uh, devoted to individual liberty, uh, limited government, free markets, and peace. Uh, in the Trade Center, uh, our work is really advanced for the purpose of uh, uh, explaining for policymakers the benefits of free trade uh, and the costs of protectionism. I'm, I'm not a transport expert. I've done some work in the transport area, uh, but my view is uh, informed primarily as, as, as a trade policy view, and, and that's where I will speak. Uh, that's what I'll speak about here today a little bit. Thanks. Guten Tag zusammen, ich bin Andrea Good afternoon, my name is Andrea Kurcic and I'm the deputy head of the Verdi Trade Union. It's a German trade union responsible for the public and private service sector companies. We have about 2.3 million members in Germany and in view of the global growth, we closely cooperate with international trade unions and I am specifically responsible for transport and logistics and postal services. I'm looking forward to our discussion. I think it's wonderful that this forum will also look at the social impact. To you, my name is K. L. Thapar. I am chairman of the Asian Institute of Transport Development. This institute has a special consultative status with the United Nations. It has a membership of 14 countries from South and Southeast Asia. In my earlier incarnation, I was secretary to the government of India in the planning commission. I have had the good fortune of working with UN, World Bank, ADB, and several other organizations, and I have worked in many countries. This institute promotes regional cooperation as well as human resource development, and it looks at the cross-cutting issues in the transport sector, be it environment, 
in labor, energy, etc. Thank you so much. Je m'appelle Marie Marie Volta. Well, I'll go to speak in English, but my presentation is now in French, my personal presentation. I have been working for the World Bank. I was a director for urban development and transport, and I work also in the European Economic Commission, and and now I'm an independent consultant. I work especially for the World Bank in this uh, about road safety in Africa. Africa in the main, and also the problems of women and transport, especially in South America. I speak. Uh, I also work for the private sector, and um, about the uh, strategy of how to develop research. I am independent in. Uh, my uh, career in public and private sector and working as an associate. Thank you. My name is Ma I'm the Ports and Transport Specialist of the United Nations Agency, the International Labour Organization, which is based in Geneva. And uh, I am in the Department of Sectoral Activities, which uh, addresses the sector-specific social and labor issues, and in particular, in my case, in the port sector, civil aviation, road transport, and railways. Thank you very much. Merci. Je vais redonner la parole à Madame. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Mukherjee, you have the floor for presenting your report. impact of globalization and globalizing in transport services, the case of India. As you all know that India is now one of the fastest growing uh, emerging uh, developing countries. Until last year, we had a growth rate of as high as 8%. We had continuous 8%, higher than 8% growth rate from 2003 onwards till 2007 and 8. In 2008 and 9, we dipped a bit because of the global slowdown, which was around 7%. And um, in this uh, year, 2009, and 10, we plan to have a growth rate of around, uh, the official figures are still 7%, but uh, there are different figures which are showing a different growth rates. So, but whatever is it, the lowest is coming to around 5%, which still keeps us one of the fastest growing economies um, of the world. Now, what does transport do in such a developing country? In a developing country like India, one of the core issues of transport is basically it is the backbone to facilitate the economic growth and trade. For trade, you need a proper infrastructure to be in place. Once your transport sector is developed, it enables FDI to come in. In fact, transport has been one of the largest sectors in India in terms of attracting FDI. It's, it's like uh, in terms, it attracts 13% of the total FDI that we receive over the years. Now, it helps the country. Once you have an efficient transport system in place, you can... Uh, if, and you, want, you can develop as an outsourcing hub very quickly. India wants to develop as an outsourcing hub for sectors like textiles, gems, and jewelries. And for that, they need to have a, a proper transportation system because they are competing with countries like China, Philippines. So we have a lot of countries which are developing their transport infrastructure. And every time per unit price, they are giving a good per unit price. So the global industries tend to move between these developing countries. And what India needs to do is to actually keep its transport pricing and transport infrastructure in such a place that it keeps on attracting the foreign investors in the goods and services sectors. Apart from this, a core objective of transport sector development is accessibility and connectivity. India is a large country and it it's, has a various variety of landscape. All part of India is not equally developed and 
your connecting your industries to your um, uh, hubs like your ports or to the airports or even connecting these every individual state capital with the national capital all these issues have been a core issue of india's transport development providing access to every village has been majority of indian population 70% of the population lives in village so accessing the uh, accessibility of the villagers to the global network has been a core issue of the indian transport policy and more importantly this street sector is treated as a sector which provides a huge amount of employment over 40 million people are directly or indirectly depending on this sector and with the growth in transport the employment in this sector is increasing and once your transport is well developed your industries get well developed so it has a very strong linkages on actual growth in the employment now indian economy if it wants to sustain the current rate of growth it has been um, various studies have been conducted and it has been said that the transport sector has to grow at a much faster pace than actually the economic growth so for example if the economic growth has to be 7 to 8% the transport sector needs to grow at least at 10% annually and uh, India has been a very focused country for investors from abroad as well. It has a, like, um, uh, there is a strong interest from large transport companies, both from the Western world like Europe and uh, US, as well as from the South Asia, Southeast Asian countries like Malaysia and others where um, big transport companies have an interest in uh, investing in India and they visualize the Indian logistic market as a very large market which will reach US 125 million in 2010. Also, the Indian market, unlike China, is an unsaturated market. There is a lot needs to be done in the transport sector. Although investment has increased many folds, it is still far beyond the demand. Like because India's trade is growing at a very fast pace, India's trade since 1991 has increased almost nine folds. So although the transport infrastructure uh, investment is increasing, it is still lacking behind and we have a demand supply gap. Now what happened in this country? Prior to 1990s, government believed that transport is a social sector. So it has to be kept under the government control so that accessibility, every responsibility of investment in this sector dependent on the government and that resulted in government induced monopolies. So there was limited choice, like for the airline, you have to either go for Air India when you are traveling abroad or Indian Airlines when you are traveling domestic, domestic market. So this is the government companies. So from there, once the demand started increasing, the demand supply gap widened and it was impossible for government alone to make all these investments. So the government started liberalizing this sector with the general liberalization of the economy in the 1990s. But still with a very cautious approach because the back in the mind the government still thought that this is a social sector and they tried playing out with various models to see you know what should be the user charges how can uh, a, a poor country afford such user charges how do you balance between the core interest of the private players to make profit and also have accessibility for that, the government kind of did a three-stage uh, uh, process. For example, if you take the e example of the road transport, what the government did is it gave, in the case of national highways, it kind of gave contracts to the private players to do it on a PPP model, and the private players were allowed to charge 
user charges. On the other hand, when you are looking into a development of a village road, this is not where the private players are interested. So in this case, the government had specific programs like the Pradhan Mantri Gram Yojana. And in this, within these programs, they, the private players were just providing the construction activities. But there, the government did not impose a charge. So how did the government fund for this project? They came out with innovative models, like they had a 2% cess on petrol and diesel, which would fund some of these projects. So they had different methods of funding for different kinds of projects. User charges, when it first came into India, it was quite a post, but now when the infrastructure and when the maintenance of large national highways have been up to the mark, user charges has now been an acceptable phenomena. In terms of encouraging FDI, government has allowed FDI in most of the construction activities. In terms of operational activities, today FDI is not allowed in foreign airlines and have restrictions in ownership of domestic airlines, so there are restrictions on investment by foreign airlines, and there are restrictions in the railway se sector. FDI is not allowed in railways. FDI is only allowed, allowed in peripheral activities in railways or in specific activities, like if you want to develop a freight corridor, yes, FDI is allowed. Or if you want to do a railway wa warehousing, FDI is allowed. Now, simultaneously as India moved away from a close to an open economy, the whole world was modernizing. And India became a part, as we globalized, we became a part of that modernization. So the older methods were gradually changing. Like from bulk cargo, everything was moving into containerized cargo, and we became a part of it. So, so along with the reforms, technology started coming in. And therefore, there was need to upgrade yourself to man the technology. The sector which was thought to be a sector which is social sector cannot make profit. That vision also changed because when multiple service providers came in, competition among the service providers actually brought down the prices. A good example of it is the Indian airline sector. When you have all these different types of service providers, even no frill airlines coming in, there was a huge price competition. There, so there is a significant pressure on even the national service provider to cut down the prices. And soon those who provided a better price got a larger share of the market. So once you are giving a better price, you, that social impact is you are increasing the accessibility to the consumers. So consumers now are gaining from two ways, more choice, better price. The other thing that is happening is once you have a large amount of investment in this sector, the sector from being fragmented try to consolidate. So there have been now large investing companies which are investing across the total logistic chain rather than the transport per se. So certain people who consider transport sector investment as a non-profitable investment but find other areas within that as profitable have now found this a good model to invest. So opening up of transport in India was a part of the opening up of the whole logistic chain. Now, uh, there has been several studies conducted in India on looking into what are the benefits, what are the social benefits and what are the social costs of liberalization. See, there have the benefits far outweighs the cost. There are some costs, but uh, I would go to them also. But firstly, let's look into the benefits. One is that better connectivity. In India, according to the official data, 25% to 30% of the fresh fruits and vegetables get wasted in the supply chain, simply because the farmer is not able to connect to the market. 
Now, what happens is once road infrastructure develops and then state infrastructure develops and then national highways are there, it's very easy for farmers to get connected to the market. So this connectivity, which are a large to a large extent by the private initiatives. And here, the private initiatives are not only of transport transporters. It comes from transporters to warehousing um, experts to even to a retail industry like uh, big players like Walmart who would like to set up their outsourcing from India. So they want to first set up their supply chain. So development of supply chain and development of road uh, infrastructure has come hand in hand in the case of India. Now, prior to the road development, a large part of the Indian villages were left out of the, the mainstream education and healthcare facilities. Now, with the development of the roads, access to medical facilities became much easier. You would see now more childbirth in hospital, less amount of infant mortality, uh, mortality rates. When you need a medical care, you have a faster access to a medical care. When you have an emergency, you have a faster tackling of the emergency because India is a country where sometimes you have rain, sometimes you have famine, sometimes you have drought, and you always need access to transport for handling your emergency. Overall, it has increased the productivity and efficiency. Like where there has been road connectivity in the villages, so there has been local private operated transport infrastructure. With this private operated transport infrastructure, people are able to develop their industry. They can access the market. Previously, if some, if some movement between two destinations used to take two to three days, now with better transport, it takes a far lesser time. Also, transport facilities like Indian big cities, cities are now coming up with uh, metro rail systems. So these systems, which are like um, uh, train systems, which are uh, intercity connections, they help now to connect your main railway stations with your important workplaces with the airport, and that helps in the movement of people. So the Productivity of individuals have improved. They are able to save time and cost and fuel. Fuel is something which is very, very scarce in India. It takes away the adverse impacts of uh, some environmental impacts of, you know, on, uh, having too many cars, um, like pollutions and things like that goes away with a well-developed uh, transport infrastructure. No, but when you come to really the employment generation part, this is probably something which is very, very widely debated in India. Because if you look into the government employee, since the role of the government has subsidized, the employee in the government sector has naturally reduced. Now, government employment in India is a very secure job because you have a full-time secure job and your work pressures are much less. Now, once you move from government to private, like construction of road does not need so many full-time employees. You can make do with many uh, part-time employees. So exactly how many people that have gone down and exactly where the employment has been generated has been widely debated. The other thing is that with the private players coming in, they are using more mechanized systems. So um, the skill levels, like previously it was like if anybody who is unskilled has nowhere to go, would be employed in the Indian retail sector or the transport sector. This no longer remains. Now if you are using sophisticated machinery, you need some amount of skill to man them. So the need for skilled workers have increased. So if previously a single axle vehicle could be run by anybody who was not even educated and did not have a formal training, today a multi-axle logistic company would require a trained driver with proper awareness and safety knowledges. Having said that, if you look into the total requirement, all the industry estimates show that the requirement in this sector is 
increasing. For example, in the trucking sector alone in 2007, there were 3 million people. The, it is predicted that by 2015, there will be 5 million people. So basically what is happening in India is that we have a huge amount of unskilled labor which we don't know what to do with, and we have a skill shortage in the case of um, semi-skilled and skilled. In fact, we do face a skill shortage in areas where we think we are global players, like seafarers. We would, if the demand grows, India would not be able to actually supply the lot. We are not producing on a yearly basis the, uh, the amount of people that is needed in that particular job. Now, what has been the one good thing about the development of transport has been the development of local industry. Previously, local industry used to cater to local markets. Now, local industries in India are now catering to global markets. And many of these local industries now are much more aware about, you know, the global players, the supply chain. And what is happening is these people try to tie up with buying houses, and now they are a part of international supply chain. And you would see India is now developing much more as a designing industry. Because uh, unlike uh, China, we really do not have that kind of Chinese abilities to produce mass. Uh, we don't go in for mass production because some of the infrastructure like power is costly in India. But we can compete with other emerging market in terms of de designing, in terms of exclusivity, which we are targeting working with the local industry once the transport has developed. Now, what we found in India is that with the development of transport, there has has been a uh, development in allied facilities, like you are, there is a better sanitation, the houses, now previously they used to build mud houses because they could not transport raw materials, so from ha mud houses the houses are becoming more concrete houses. On the other hand, if there is a problem at one corner, transport kind of brings it forth. So for example, if there is a disease in one part of India, today it does not take time to spread because of the development of the transport infrastructure. So it has its positive and it has its negative sides. But the, but the positive sides have far outweighed the negative in the case of India. Now, what is happening? Now, demand for transport in India is rising and the speed of development is not as good. Once we come to investment, uh, there are several players who are doing the investment. But there is no strategy of how and where to do the maintenance, how to do the maintenance. So what happens is once the investment is done, because of the poor maintenance, the things come back to square one. So the focus of the Indian government today should be on what kind of methods they should use to actually do ma maintenance. Then there are regional disparities. Like even in the Pradhan Mantri Gram Yojana, like I was talking to Daniel about Gujarat. There are states which has come in and they have, you know, progressively gone and made the investment, while other states are say, staying uh, behind. These states which are doing well actually are pushing the central government, are trying to get the investors, where the others are kind of uh, taking a back seat. So the, within India, the interregional divide has increased. The third biggest problem is that because in India still the logistic inefficiencies persist, the India's um, problem is that we opened up the market in a rush because we were opening up all these sectors and the regulation followed. And in many cases, the regulatory regime is still being experimented with. So in that context, we do have certain planning, regulatory, uh, administrative reforms that are needed, like what should be the right pricing. Sometimes wrong pricing, like if you are subsidizing diesel because truck is operated on that and you are charging petrol more, you are actually um, moving in for a less efficient uh, transport fuel. So those are the kind of things that we really need to look into. Skill shortage is a big problem in India, which I have already mentioned. Now, uh, to mention that now we are in the global slowdown and 
India is designing its stimulus package. India wants to keep its high growth rate. And India is one of the, I think, nicely placed countries because we have an unsaturated transport sector. And we are now going back to the Keynesian theory where investment in this transport sector is good. And the government has now refocused on the stimulus package on going back and investing in the transport sector and linking such investments with other programs like Pradhan Mantri Gram Yojana program program of the government is now linked with the rural employment program. So that is basically in involving the local participation in the infrastructure. Merci, Madame. Thank you, Mrs. Mukherjee, for this paper and the enthusiasm and dedication with which you have presented your paper here. We could have gone on listening to you forever here, but uh, I think uh, you really highlighted uh, uh, the main issues here. I would say uh, that the paper of Mrs. Mukherjee was not distributed, but uh, uh, it is uh, in the proceedings and, and the CD which was distributed to you, uh, which you received uh, this morning, Mr. Marius Miliuc. I have been requested to confine my presentation within 15 minutes, so it's a kind of a bullet point presentation, but it will present a number of issues that will generate, uh, hopefully, an, an interesting discussion. So I'm going to talk about the social dimension of globalization and international transport, the concerns of the ILO constituents, and what do we mean by constituents? It will be, become clearer to you uh, after a couple of uh, slides. Let me first... Uh, uh, give you some background information on the ILO. It is very interesting for us that uh, uh, you and others have a, a clear understanding of what is the ILO. Just before lunchtime, somebody uh, uh, talking to me, he thought that we represent the unions because of, of the name of this organization. So it is important for us to give you some background information. The ILO was founded in 1919 with the Treaty of Versailles just after the First World War. So it pre-existed uh, the United Nations, so it became the first United Nations specialized agency. And uh, presently it has 182 member states. So the ILO is the United Nations specialized agency which seeks the promotion of social justice and internationally recognized human and labor rights. Now, within the United Nations system, the ILO has a unique tripartite structure with workers and employers participating as equal partners with governments in the work of its governing organs. So I will put this in simple words. Other UN agencies uh, have member states, but their member states are only represented by their governments, like the International Maritime Organization is represented by the ministers who are responsible for uh, maritime transport. World Health Organization by the ministers of health. Uh, UNESCO by the ministers of uh, education and culture. At the ILO, member states are represented by governments, employer representatives, and worker representatives. And they have an equal status. They have an equal voice. And the employers and workers representatives are... Uh, uh, selected independently. There is no influence from the government. So these are our, the ILO constituents, workers, employers, and governments. So the ILO is there to uh, care and protect the interests of governments, employers, and workers. And we do this through pre uh, providing a forum to our constituents, the forum of social dialogue. So we use social dialogue to address the social and labor issues uh, uh, in the world of work. So we, are, we address social and labor I issues at the workplace. So I will, uh, my presentation uh, uh, will be presented from this perspective. 
social and labor issues at the workplace. So uh, uh, the ILO, uh, because of its uh, structure, it's very close to its constituents. We have almost daily communication and uh, regarding the transport with the governing body decision, uh, an advisory committee uh, on transport has been established where uh, the representatives at the global level of the employers and the workers and the representatives of the governments get together and they uh, propose to the ILO what would be the agenda of the ILO for the subsequent years. So all our projects, all our activities are constituent driven. We address issues that they, they, are, they stem from the real needs of our constituents. So it is very important that uh, we know at any time what are the current concerns of the ILO constituents. So I'm, I'm going to give you the current concerns of our constituents in the different modes of transport. Uh, let me say that in road transport, we work very closely uh, with the International Transport Workers Federation and with its uh, European uh, arm, the European Transport Workers Federation. They're excellent partners. And also with IRU, the International Road Transport Union. So border crossing issues. This is a major concern. We've been talking about that for many years and this uh, uh, subject, uh, subject uh, addresses uh, a, a number of uh, sub-issues like long delays, border control, psychological violence uh, to the drivers, discrimination, working and living conditions, unofficial payments, the environment, the visa issue, etc. So I leave this as a point of discussion. We can, uh, the ILO in 2006 uh, uh, addressed this issue on a three-day event and it proved to be inadequate. HIV AIDS, it's a major concern of our constituents, uh, particularly in the road transport sector. And I will leave this as a point of discussion. There is a lot to be said about this major concern of our constituents. Training and qualifications, not only for drivers, but also for non-mobile logistic workers. Uh, now at the European level, ETF, the European Transport Workers Federation, and the RU, they have embarked on an EC-funded uh, project uh, to to address this issue. How to make the profession of the international driver more attractive to young persons? This is a very uh, important issue for the ILO constituents because uh, young persons are not any more attracted in this profession. And despite the fact of the crisis, now that we have the, a lot of job losses, there was a major concern uh, until a year and a half ago uh, our constituents were very much uh, were very much concerned how they would uh, support uh, the demand of uh, international haulage if there are no young drivers anymore. Social dumping, of course, it's a major issue, particularly within the European uh, region. Violence and attacks against the cargo and drivers, it's a major issue. Uh, safe and sufficient parking uh, and areas of rest, which is linked to the previous one. A major issue, a major concern by our constituents. Violence, uh, from the simple uh, violence incidences of uh, uh, pa uh, you know, passengers trying to evade uh, uh, fares, to organize crime. Our drivers are attacked, bus drivers in the evening, uh, taxi drivers, etc., is a, a, a major issue. Self-employed drivers, you know, this uh, category of, of, of workers, uh, it seems that <laughs> they don't receive uh, the same freedom uh, re regarding hours of work. They are more free to work at their own time. They, uh, uh, particularly in Europe, the EC directive has not yet uh, cover this group of workers and also self-employed uh, drivers. Uh, uh, there are, there's nobody to cover uh, their social protection. So uh, it's an issue there how social drivers enjoy social protection. And then there is the issue at the EC level of clarification of rest and driving times. There's a lot of confusion, confusion in this area. It's a major concern of uh, our constituents. And differences in the interpretation of, of, of the various standards from country to country. 
countries, uh, different countries, member states uh, tend to uh, give uh, different kinds of interpretation. So uh, the drivers, they have this stress, this agony when they move from one country to another country, how they will be treated by the enforcement uh, 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 agencies of the country, the police force, etc. Safety pertinent to parking of containers, this is a major issue raised particularly by ITF, the International Transport Workers Federation, where uh, drivers uh, in the road transport sector are involved in accidents because uh, the containers were parked sometime before by somebody else and they were not parked correctly and there has been a fatal accident. The drivers are accused of being responsible for something they did not have any control. And, uh, the, um, uh, and, the, and the ILO, together with uh, ITF and uh, RU and other modes of transport, will soon address this issue at the uh, international level. Impact of economic crisis on employment, this is a, a major issue, and, uh, and um, we have a lot of uh, figures to share with you if you would like to see. So uh, regarding HIV AIDS, I would like to show you uh, an example of um, uh, of a common approach by the social partners. You can see here a training toolkit on, 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 training toolkit on HIV AIDS in the road transport sector, which has been developed and is being promoted by the International Labour Organization, the International Road Transport Union, which is the employees' organization, and of course, ITF, the International Transport Workers' Federation. Now let's move into international railways uh, transport. The main concern for our constituents is privatization of undertaking, which leads to job losses and also compromises in safety. And uh, HIV AIDS, it's surprising that the, uh, uh, our constituents, when they saw uh, the work of the ILO on HIV AIDS in road transport sector, uh, particularly UIC and ITF, UIC is the employer's organization of, of railways based in uh, in Paris, they came and they knocked the door one morning of the ILO and said, we want you to help us on HIV in railways and can you please design a similar project you, you did for the road transport sector because it's, a it's an issue of major concern for railways and we have already embarked and we, we already have a draft, uh, uh, um, uh, the draft, the first draft of, of a toolkit. Uh, current concerns of the ILO constituents in the port sector is free access to port services is the f famous uh, uh, at, uh, well attempt twice of the European Commission to pass uh, uh, this directive. So this is a major concern. Uh, who be, would be should be eligible? Who has the uh, capability, the capacity to provide? Uh, uh, port services. And this is a major concern, particularly by, um, uh, by the workers' group. Safety and health, including safety pertinent to packing of containers, the port sector has the same concerns as the uh, road transport sector. Security, of course, you know, after 11th of, uh, of uh, September uh, 2001, this has been uh, of a major concern, and uh, particularly because of the ISPS code of the IMO, everybody has to comply with this mandatory requirement of the uh, SOLAS Convention of the IMO, so security is a major concern. This uh, training, uh, this is a major issue. It has been given recently priority by the European Commission. Uh, the European Commission, in, in its uh, policy statement uh, in, in 2007, uh, uh, single uh, identified training as one of the priorities because there are no um, uh, international standards on port training. And uh, I can announce to you that the ILO uh, has already embarked with the governing body decision to work with its constituents to develop uh, international guidelines on port uh, on training in ports uh, in collaboration with the European Commission but it would be an international activity. This is a 2010-2011 uh, uh, ILO activity. Sectoral social dialogue is uh, highly promoted by the ILO and also by the European Commission. Um, uh, sectoral social dialogue is uh, is supported by the European Commission through the establishment of sectoral social dialogue committees. And the port sector is the one which is missing 
from that list of sectoral social dialogue committees, there is one in road transport, in railways, in civil aviation, but ETF, uh, along with FIPOR, the Federation of Private Sector uh, uh, Private Port Operators, uh, European Private Port Operators, and other stakeholders, together European Commission, they are trying to overcome some problems, and hopefully by the end of the year we'll have this sectoral social dialogue committee in ports. Social and labor issues due to port reforms. This has always been on the agenda, uh, including by the World Bank, and they did uh, excellent work, the World Bank, with the uh, port reform uh, toolkit, and Mary Vaughan here to my right. Uh, maybe she has a lot to say about that because she has been behind it. Uh, and the impact of the economic crisis, of, of course, on the employment, the ILO has undertaken some assessments uh, recently, so I have figures to uh, share with you if you would like on, on, on this issue. In shipping, the concerns are the impact of the economic crisis on employment in shipping, of course, the impact of the economic crisis on the development and maintenance of adequate numbers of officers and engineers. I'll just give you one case study. The Maritime University of Constanta, has a problem because its students cannot graduate because it is mandatory according to IMO regulations that they spend few months before graduation as apprentices on ships. Now there are thousands of ships which are laid off and there are not enough ships for them to go and do the training so they cannot qualify and this will compromise the future because after the economic recovery there will not be enough officers and, uh, and uh, engine room engineers. So and there are a few thousands only from Romania, imagine the, uh, the uh, other regions. So this is a major concern. Of course, security, the ISPS code, ratification and application of the ILO Maritime Convention of 2006. This is at the uh, top of the list of priorities of the ILO constituents. And the basic wage of able seafarers. Um, uh, in February, there was this uh, a joint committee uh, of the employers and workers, and they failed to reach uh, an agreement because they had to review the basic wage, but because of the crisis, uh, they, they said that they will reconvene next year. Fair treatment of seafarers in the event uh, of a maritime accident, and liability and compensation regarding claims for death, personal injury, and abandonment of seafarers. These are really serious social and labor issues. And of course, HIV AIDS, now the ILO has been invited to, uh, uh, to join forces with other UN agencies and the IMO to develop a toolkit on HIV AIDS for seafarers. And we use the one on road transport as the model. And we have uh, finally civil aviation. Uh, there's a major concern about open skies, um, uh, the social partners and particularly the workers' group, they, they, they would like an involvement in the negotiation for open skies. They are stakeholders, they think they are affected, and uh, this is a major issue uh, about the involvement of the representatives of, of, of the workers in the civil aviation industry on the negotiation for open skies. The impact of the economic crisis of, of employment, uh, civil aviation is always the one which is hit first, and the impact of the economic crisis on the development and maintenance of adequate levels of skilled personnel, particularly in the air uh, traffic management. Uh, there is a shortage of air traffic controllers worldwide of about uh, 5,000 skilled air traffic controllers. Uh, and uh, the industry has not recovered from the shortage created from the previous two crises in the 90s and in the early 2000s because training uh, is reduced or is stopped, is, is a way to reduce costs, and then there is a backlog. So we have the third crisis in the last uh, uh, 15 years or 20 years, and there is a cumulative uh, uh, impact, and of course it's a compromise of safety. I hope that you will all get on the plane to go back home, you will not, I will not discourage you. Of course, uh, security issue, you know what is happening in the airports about security on the planes. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I have given you a long menu, a long list of the major uh, social and labor issues that are the, the priority list of our, the ILO constituents. And uh, finally, I would like to mention uh, the work of the ILO uh, 
uh, on globalization uh, is uh, the report of the World uh, Com uh, Commission on Globalization, which was established uh, by the ILO and published uh, uh, this uh, report, the Fair, Fair Globalization, Creating Opportunities uh, for All, and uh, it's available in uh, several languages, and you can find it on the website, and it, it, it gives uh, some uh, guidelines on, on fair globalization. And, you know, transport is one of the four pillars of globalization, uh, together with uh, information technology, uh, international standards, and uh, deregulation, yeah? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Merci, Monsieur Thank you, Mr. Melitou. We have listened uh, to two very dedicated uh, reports. Uh, but they don't seem to have a common point. They are supplementary, complementary to each other. And uh, so we have two levels of debates uh, here. Uh, perhaps we should first discuss Mrs. Mukherjee's paper and then the paper of Mr. Bellitou. And uh, I'll perhaps uh, then also put in my own report, which links up with the previous speaker here. Mrs. Mukherjee. Uh, has shown us the role of transport in reducing economic inequalities, social ones, between countries and within a country, like uh, this was the case in India. And the report of Mr. Mertiu is uh, very broad in its scope, uh, showed employment, conditions of work, remuneration, training, education in various sectors for all member countries, and uh, I think it's uh, one 180 countries altogether. And so let's put this into parenthesis, is what you have said. And uh, after the break at uh, 15.30 hours, uh, we will come back to your report. But let's first focus on Mrs. Mukherjee's report. This highlights uh, the importance of uh, transport playing a major role in reducing social inequality was in India and between the different uh, Indian population sectors and the facilitation of the connectivity, entrance into markets, etc. And uh, you were mainly focusing on India, which is a vast country, but it doesn't stand for the entirety of all the countries here. So let's ask some question here. What measures, apart of based on this example, uh, can we confirm that uh, transport can play a role in the developing countries or the emerging countries here uh, in their international exchanges and within these countries? To what a degree can the transport uh, sector play a role here? Because transport uh, 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 very often uh, has a certain focus and a periphery, a hub and a periphery, and one profits the other perhaps not so much. And uh, can, uh, what political measures can be used to facilitate the role of transport here when it comes to reducing inequalities? Do we have to introduce precautionary measures here? Or are there some other questions to be asked? I throw this discussion open to the panel first. Let's go around the table, uh, perhaps about if somebody is highly motivated, please show, indicate this to us and you will be given the floor right away. Thank you, Monsieur Bernadet. You've raised a lot of, uh, a lot of questions related to the presentations, which were both, both excellent. And, and I read uh, the, your paper uh, as well as yours, Monsieur Bernadet. They're both uh, very, very informative and excellent. Um, I, let me, I, I'm coming at this from a more general perspective than probably others at the table because my background is not really that transport intensive. But just to demonstrate, uh, and I'll, I'll be just two minutes, just to demonstrate uh, that we do involve ourselves in these issues. I just wanted to uh, do a little bit of self-promotion here. Uh, my colleague, uh, Swami A.R., who's uh, a countryman of Arpita, has done a, a paper on ports uh, liberalization 
in, in India, uh, in particular uh, in, in the, the, the country, uh, the, the state of uh, Gujarat. And it's, it's a very compelling example of, in my view, why we don't need harmonization. Uh, because here, here we have a state that is giving a demonstration effect for uh, uh, means to attract investment, means to, uh, to develop and facilitate uh, the transport sector. Here's a paper that I did a few years ago called While Doha Sleeps, Securing Economic Growth Through Trade Facilitation. Both of these papers are available at, at our Cato website, uh, at uh, Cato, C -A -T -O .org. The, 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 the second half of the century, I think, has been characterized by declining barriers. And, and Marios talked about some of the pillars of uh, ILO uh, uh, pillars, but transportation has played an, uh, an incredibly important role, as has communications as have the reduction of political barriers, trade barriers, the opening of China to the West, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Because of that, we have bec become much, much larger, and that, that's a good thing. Uh, and it now enables developing countries to put aside arguments that they need infant industry protectionism, that they need to develop industries vertically from the ground up, because now we are not, it's not us versus them. It is global supply chains that are, that are competing, global supply chains that have value embedded from rich countries, emerging countries, many countries, competing against other global supply chains, uh, which are much the same. India's experience is, uh, is transferable to other developing countries. It's happening in many developing countries, but it's happening at different paces, and there are different obstacles. I mean, each country has its own set of circumstances, its own institutions, uh, uh, cultures, uh, the, the rule of law, whether or not it's respected. I just want to give a couple of brief examples uh, uh, where, uh, of countries that are, are in need of the kinds of reforms that, are, that India has been doing, but are not necessarily ready for them at, at the same level. Cameroon. There's a story, uh, Robert Guest, who used to write for The Economist, tells a story about taking a trip with a truck driver from the port city to the interior to deliver Guinness beer. It was supposed to take six hours, the trip, but it took four days. Uh, it took four days because they were stopped 47 times along the way uh, at makeshift uh, toll, uh, toll booths, basically bandits. For, for, uh, they were stopped 47 times and, and, uh, and they had to you know, pay bribes, basically. I don't think Cameroon is ready for the types of uh, types of reforms that India has done. It needs to develop its rule of law. It needs to develop other things first. Another example uh, is Yemen. Uh, there's a story that the World Bank tells uh, in one of its uh, annual reports about Tariq, who's a, a tuna fisherman. Uh, and Tariq can sell his tuna to Germany for fresh for $5.20 a kilo, or he can sell it frozen to Pakistan for $1.50 per kilo. Well, because it takes 33 days on average for products to get out of Yemen because of transportation deficiencies and because of bureaucratic uh, red tape and other snafus, he only sells about 10 to 15 percent to Germany. I, I don't know what 33-day-old fresh fish tastes like, uh, but uh, he, ultimately he's losing a lot of money because he has to ship most of his stuff frozen to Pakistan. In his case, he's losing $10 million a year. So. Yes, there are, there's plenty of opportunity in other countries for the kinds of reforms uh, that India has implemented, but uh, probably in, in, in different degrees depending on the level of development. Merci. Votre témoignage va dans le même sens. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to, to follow up on what yeah. I and Daniel have said because they brought two different, um, uh, um, they complemented the, their presentation. But there is a reason why the case of India is first uh, usable, I mean, usable everywhere and illustrate very, in a very articulated fashion the social impact of transport within the profession and within India and placing India on the international market. On the other hand, there are special features of India, and we could say that we could have a, almost a topology of countries, and it is not quite fair to compare Cameroon or Yemen with India, perhaps for several reasons. The first one uh, is the location. It is not the same if you have access to the sea, if you, have, if you are near a large market, like Yemen, actually, 
or if you are isolated, landlocked, and far from um, markets. And in fact, in the last World Development Report, the, the World Bank starts by organizing the countries by their size and their proximity or distance to markets, because this is the unfair starting point. The, the, the world is not flat, is not fair, and if you're in Bolivia or in Tibet, you have a disadvantage because of your location, low density, and also your size. If you are small, if you have low density, and if you are isolated, you start badly. And then, transport makes this worst, in the sense that originally you had cities that located through um, near a river, and it was a small advantage, but immediately density of investment and attention and, and uh, linkage was done to that city, and so the, the economic space becomes more lumpy as cities grow and economies become more dense. And in that respect, transport plays a very, very large uh, impact. And we could say that there are perhaps several levels of intensity of transport um, uh, contribution or guilt, depending, and um, uh, several moments. At the local level, we could say that uh, at first, and I think Arpita's document shows that well, um, transport brings um, first diminution of inequality in a country, improves things. But then it gets worse again when there is a certain level, and all the countries have show a graph where there is decrease of inequality, then capitalism gets really greedy, and then things become better when after a, a middle class establishes, the governance improves and the demand of social society, so civil society, are such that there is a level of balance to, um, uh, to, to uh, capitalistic greed, if I may say. At national level, uh, however, um, inequality first gets worse. If you look, and you, can, you say it in your article when you show those states who are doing well, who are taking the good decisions, and they do better, and the others are left behind, and they go worse. So in the, in the national, uh, at, a, at, at the national scale, things get first uh, worse before they, they increase. And at international level, then it is uh, the trickiest part. Because, in fact, we can see that there is, con there is first divergence, exactly like in the national level, but uh, things converge afterwards, but only really for growing economies. And we could say that the, the global market has made uh, things uh, harder for improvement uh, recently than it has been in the past. Not that there is no possibility, but it takes longer or short today for a poorer country to uh, catch up than another one. And one of the reasons is that the scales of um, um, uh, the scale of traffic, the scale of uh, savings has become more and more difficult to, to catch up with. I would say the uh, one of the most interesting feature of the world today is that it's organized east-west. You look at the exchanges, especially shipping routes, they all go east-west. And the costs, if you have to get out of that route, then the costs are multiplied by four immediately. Latin America and Africa, where you have to go from a big ship to a small ship to get immediately you have very higher, much higher cost and a big disadvantage. And this is getting worse when the scale of traffic increases and therefore the uh, unfairness, the lumpiness of the economic space has become more exacerbated. At the time, however, when technology and, possibility and possibly communication give also a better chance or new uh, option for niche development to the smaller economies. I will stop here. Merci, madame. Je trouve que vous avez Thank you. You have really corroborated what has been said here, but you have even complicated matters here. Of course, we can't generalize, Mr. Duck. Mr. Chairman, I must compliment you that you have tried to highlight the role of the excess in removing poverty, 
or bringing the peripheral regions in the mainstream of, it, of development. If you recall the Millennium Development Goals, which have been set by the United Nations, unfortunately, there is no reference to the role of transport. This largely arises because people are not aware of the role of access, accessibility, and its transport amelioration conditions. The level of understanding of this relationship between transport infrastructure and human well-being in general and poverty in particular has been inadequate. And indeed, the distributional socio-economic impact of providing access, especially the poor, has been less recognized. Just to supplement what uh, Arpita had mentioned, in the institute, we had done a study, a graphical representation. I wish the slide was made available, but I'll just show it to you. Wherever there is better access, there is less poverty. The second, normally the traditional role of a highway has always been considered that it facilitates intercity travel. Its impact on the poor, or the population living in its vicinity has never been considered. An empirical study in this regard was done in the Institute, which brought out that the poverty reduces by 12% within the influence zone. The index of well-being improves by 32%. The enrollment of the, of, the, of the students improved, particularly of the girl students. Having said that, it is unfortunate that the political economy has never taken that the accessibility to the villages or to the backward areas an important thing. Here, Mr. Chairman, I would like to say that this is an entitlement to which they should be provided. And this entitlement is an important thing which should be highlighted in this particular conference. There's one more aspect, Mr. Chairman. A large part of the developing countries, as you know, was under the colonial rule. The traditional roots which were there were redrawn when the boundaries were redrawn. As a result, you will find a lot of trade is moving on circuitous maritime routes, which could easily move across the border at much lesser cost. I will give you a small example. If in India were to send a container load of handmade tools from one of the cities in India, to going to Bangladesh, the next door neighbor, the container starts, goes to Mumbai, one of the ports, goes to UAE. From there, it comes to Colombo. It goes to Port Klang in Singapore. And from Port Klang, it comes to Chittagong, and then goes to Dhaka. The cost of that is almost $2,000 extra if the same was to be followed by the normal land routes which were available, the cost would be much less, and the human welfare will improve to that extent. Because you made a reference to the, you see the largely the session over here is confined to the social impact of the international transport. Having said that, so I will just address this issue, and if I have the permission, I'll move forward if it is okay with you. And that is, the international transport, as you know, is largely controlled by, is, is, is largely shipping and civil aviation. It's largely controlled by the developed countries. And in this context, transport as a percentage of the total costs are disproportionately high for the developing countries as compared to the developed countries. 
The demand for transport, as you know, is a derived one. For any given reduction in the trade volume, there is more than proportionate reduction in incomes in the transport sector because more people get affected. This is at the general level. Income effect of reduction in employment is comparatively higher in developing countries. This is because the labor intensity per unit of capital employed in transport services is much higher. There is a large pool of skilled and unskilled manpower from the developing countries that is employed in shipping, one of the benefits of that. But Mr. Chairman, you know, the automation and the labor-saving technologies have resulted in drastic reduction of the manning scales. As a result, the employment potential is reduced. This particular downturn has meant layoff, a huge layoff of the labor from these countries, which has been there. Well, I'll just summarize in this part, and that is all downturns, whether global, regional, or local, have an exaggerated negative social effect on transport sector because incomes, in this case, tend to fall more drastically. They also fall more quickly as well as more suddenly. And when most of the labor employed in this sector is unskilled, or semi-skilled, as is generally the case with the developing countries, the social consequences tend to be worse. I will address one more issue, and then I would have finished, and that is regarding the role of the state in the development of the transport infrastructure. A mention has been made, and probably the world is thinking that the private sector is the panacea for the development of the infrastructure sector. As probably all of you know, you should divide the infrastructure into two parts. One is the fixed infrastructure, and that the second one is the movable infrastructure. In the movable infrastructure, there is enough private sector participation, be it shipping, be it airlines, be it the trucks, or in any, any movable asset, if the private sector is prepared to do it because of the very dynamics of the industry. He can shift it, he can change the lot supply chains. The problem lies in the fixed infrastructure, and there the role of the state becomes important. Historically, all fixed infrastructure has been developed by the state. You take the case throughout the world. We have a couple of thousands of autobahns, quite a f in hundreds of numbers of these arteries which are there. They are in no way an example that the state should jettison its assigned role. No private sector will ever come in the development of the railways or in the development of the highways in a country like India, spanning thousands of kilometers. They may, they are welcome, when they make investments in local areas, be it, let's say, over a particular bridge or a small artery where the traffic volumes are high. And I thought I will demystify this role of the private sector in development of infrastructure. And it is all the more important when we are talking of the connectivity of a large number of villages and to bring them into the mainstream, mainstream of the economic life of the countries. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Tapar. Excusez-moi de vous avoir fait signe qu'il fallait s'interrompre, mais nous sommes bientôt à la pause. Alors, Monsieur Meletiu m'a demandé la parole. J'espère qu'il ne m'en voudra pas si je préfère demander à la salle, si, avant la pause, s'il y a des, des questions sur ce premier thème de discussion. Des questions ou des réactions. Ah. We are not getting interpretation in English, please. Interpreters. Je demandais s'il y avait des questions dans la salle ou des réactions aux interventions que nous avons. Uh, whether the audience would like to comment on what you have been uh, hearing. No questions.
The social dumping issue has been mentioned just a little, and maybe it would be worthwhile to go a little bit more into the details about it. Well, this will come in the second part of our discussion. This lady has asked for the floor. Well, two questions. The characteristics of mobility in India here, this uh, better accessibility, connectivity, is it now close to the Occidental model, or do you have your own standalone model here? And is there a difference of mobility between men and women in the light of the amelioration of the transport systems? You spoke about the accessibility to jobs to employment. Two questions. Number one, does this uh, favor uh, the role of women here in the transport sector, not only in well, sub-employment and so on? And uh, secondly, whether they make a good employment of these possibilities? <clears throat> to the mobility issue the mobility has definitely improved both for men and women because once you get in access to the infrastructure you are able to move around but the problem is like this that whether the women is employment of women in, in infrastructure has improved um, I would say yes at the high end there has been an improvement like today you would see uh, women going in for a job like being a pilot because there has been at one point in time there has been a severe crisis of pilots in India so um, you know women were taking up this occupation so there has been a change in occupational patterns like previously it was only air hostess so you know men would not go in for uh, stewardess kind of an occupation but today there has been the occupations are becoming interchanged in some of the industries but really when it comes to an industry like truck driving it is still very very restricted to to men because of the other issues like safety and you are traveling long uh, night working hours. So those occupations have not been really taken up by women in India. So or you know even like a bus driving or a taxi driving these occupation is still very much male dominated and hardly you see a woman in this occupation. Merci. No, you're having said that. Thank you. Just say, you see the access is uh, uh, is gender neutral. It, it doesn't make any difference. Secondly, uh, there are always sectors throughout the world where women will not like to join. There are no barriers in India in terms of employment. It could be a woman, it could be a man, but as she mentioned at the present moment, the men prefer certain professions and the women prefer certain other professions, but there are no barriers. I think the problems uh, of access of men and women uh, to tran the transport sector isn't typical for India. It's all for all the developing countries, but also in my country. And uh, of course, we do have an economic uh, crisis, and uh, it's more a sociological issue rather than accessibility. Or are there any other questions? on this topic of transport, uh, reducing inequalities in developing countries between the developing countries. If not, since we have gone over time, let's have uh, our coffee break, 20 minutes as envisaged. So please keep us in the time frame, because we all have a lot of topics to discuss, social dumping, for example, and also uh, all the issues raised by Mr. Militio. So in, within 20 minutes, we'll be back.